if you think about what licensing really is, it effectively is a constriction in supply, and it's of course an arbitrary constriction in supply, meaning you're going to basically allow a gatekeeper to decide who gets to come into the industry. The gatekeepers themselves are the ones who already have gotten into the industry. The licensing boards are incumbent license holders themselves, and so you might want to see what kind of competition are they going to want to restrict and how are they going to do that. I was looking uh, last year. There was a, uh, a a bill that made its way through the through the legislature that uh, would have created a division in the Department of Justice to battle economic crimes, and they even used that language, which I thought was it's kind of eerie. How the more permissive we get, the more we get into a permissive society, the more all these old uh, kind of Soviet esque terms uh, come come into play. And uh, uh, the senator who proposed it. Uh, Kathleen Galgiani uh, of Stockton, she said, it's very important because uh, people working in the underground economy, it results in significant uncollected revenues that are desperately needed to fund basic government services. So <laughs> I was thinking of that, and uh, for one reason, I, I had a, uh, my think tank, our think tank, the R Street Institute, had a bill two days later after I wrote a column comparing her to a Soviet commissar uh, that we needed her vote on that would have allowed people to shampoo hair without a license, without having to spend $19,000 mm -hmm. in a uh, barbering and cosmetology degree so you can shampoo hair. Now, I don't have much, but I've managed through most mm. of my life to not injure myself <laughs> in washing my head. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the lobbyists for the... Well, that, that's exactly it. So, so the lobbyists for the other side who represented the barbering and cosmetology sc schools actually pointed that out to her. Uh, my lobbyist was fuming and I was laughing. But anyway, I, I thought of that because that's the end result of this licensing regimen. If, if, you, get, if you don't get permission, uh, you get arrested. And I just wanted to use that as, that as a leeway into our panel on occupational licensing and I also wondered, I'm hoping we'll talk a little bit about Assembly Bill 5, which isn't exactly occupational licensing, but I'm no longer allowed to write more than 35 freelance articles a year, even if I ask permission, it's just outright banned. So it's, it's uh, according to the new law, the state government, if, if you write more than uh, 35 articles a year, you have to be hired as an employee of the person having you do it. So I, I think that kind of gives us a degree, the idea of the degree to which we're going with this permission society. So anyway, we've got some panelists here. What I'll do is, um, before I introduce them, I was asked to mention that, uh, uh, bring cards up to me with questions. Uh, so you've got cards around there. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just introduce everyone, and then we'll each uh, do everyone will do a short spiel, and then we want to get a discussion going. So um, I want to introduce James Prieger. He's an economist specializing in regulatory economics, industrial organization, economics of illicit markets, and applied econometrics. He's a professor of Pepperdine University School of Public Policy, and previously he was an assistant professor of economics at the University of California, Davis, where my daughter's getting her ag degree. Uh, Steven Slavinsky. Uh, as a senior research fellow and director of the Doing Business North America project at the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty at Arizona State University. He formerly held the position of senior economist at the Goldwater Institute, research fellow at the Mercatus Center, and senior editor um, at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. We have Adam Thier, uh, senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He specializes in innovation, entrepreneurialism, internet and free speech issues, and uh, particular focus on the public policy concerns surrounding emerging technologies. So that will make him uh, a good one to discuss the San Francisco uh, thing. And Paul Avalar is managing attorney of the Institute for Justice, Arizona office. He joined the Institute in uh, 2010, litigates free speech, property rights, economic liberty, school choice, and other constitutional cases in, in federal and state courts. So. Um, those are our panelists. We're going to get started uh, and uh, with James. So uh, thank you. Okay. Well, also on behalf of Pepperdine SVP, it's also nice to see all of you here. So I'll give you a second welcome. Um, just a, f a few comments here from the standpoint of an academic economist. This is an easy topic, occupational licensing, to speak about because it's not really a right, left, conservative, liberal issue. 
issue from the economic point of view. It's just not something that any economist would really defend, um, at least any mainstream economist. It's also, so I just wanted to mention um, a couple things here that would represent relatively mainstream economic attitudes about occupational licensing. Um, first of all, it's not something that we study much. Um, some of the present people here accepted in a very small uh, set of people out there. For example, for every um, article written on, every hundred articles written on unions, for example, taking you know, pro or con positions or analyzing those, there might be one article on occupational licensing. Um, but the general attitude of economists, nonetheless, is, is pretty unified. We view them the same way uh, that we view medieval guilds. We view them the same way, to a certain extent, that we view unions. In other words, um, occupational licensing is all, it's really more about public choice than economics. It's the fact that you set up barriers to limit competition once you are in an industry. And whether it is something as trivial as a cosmetologist or someone shampooing hair, or something that might hit a little closer to home for some of you, accountants and lawyers and doctors, um, and the whole spectrum in between, the large part of what's going on here is just protectionism from competition. Um, some of the things that I won't give away punchlines now, but some of the things that we do know in the literature are um, what happens to the supply side in protected industries. Okay, so what does it do to the number of workers in those industries? What does it do to wages in those industries? We know what happens there. What happens to prices for consumers? Pretty clear answer there as well. What happens to geographic mobility of workers? And you can guess the answer <laughs> there. And of course, that feeds into why we get higher prices and higher wages and so forth. And then finally, um, to the extent that there is a reason proposed for occupational licensing, it's usually quality, right? We want our doctors and our dentists to be licensed so that they will be higher quality. Literature says, eh, not so fast. So I will stop there for now. <laughs> well, I'll go second. So thank you for not stepping on my punch lines. I do appreciate yeah. that, James. Uh, thank you all for having me, and thanks for coming uh, today. It's also an honor to hear Tim, an old friend of mine. Although I'm surprised he didn't quote the philosopher James Tiberius Kirk, something that I'm <laughs> no waiting to happen, and it didn't. But yeah. all that, despite that, it was a fantastic uh, set of remarks. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work I've done on entrepreneurship uh, and uh, occupational licensing and how it influences specific segments of the workforce. And, uh, and as, as James mentioned, you know, there haven't been a whole lot of work uh, in this area. I do feel like it's a growth industry now, though, because we're beginning to see uh, more data come online that we didn't have just five or 10 years ago. And so I think more economists are beginning to understand the importance of this issue. Um, and if you look at specific demographic groups, there's going to be a differential impact of licensing. Now, if you think about what licensing really is, it effectively is a constriction in supply, and it's, of course, an arbitrary constriction in supply, meaning you're going to basically allow a gatekeeper to decide who gets to come into the industry. The gatekeepers themselves are the ones who already have gotten into the industry. The licensing boards are incumbent license holders themselves, and so you might want to see what kind of competition are they going to want to restrict, and how are they going to do that? The way they do that typically is through uh, high fees, uh, and although most importantly, through high levels of uh, education requirements, training requirements, hour requirements for apprenticeships and, and things of this sort. And so you can begin to see where you might start finding some of the heaviest burdens of these licenses falling in terms of uh, demographics within the workforce. And so I decided to look at low income entrepreneurs and wanted to figure out if this low income entrepreneurship rate at the state and comparing states to one another might be impacted and uh, explained by licensing burdens. And so luckily, the Institute for Justice, from which Paul hails, uh, did actually a wonderful, actually now two studies, but the one that I looked at was a very first study that looked at uh, what they call low-income occupations, about 105 or so, uh, which you might consider uh, service occupations, but those generally people have lower uh, education levels, and, and what sorts of burdens they would see at the state level in terms of hours and fees, and just whether the state actually licenses that occupation or not. And what was kind of amazing about this is that when you do the analysis and the regression analysis, looking at that data, comparing it to census data on entrepreneurship rates among people in the bottom two quintiles of income in each state, the relevant factor wasn't, uh, wasn't the fees or the number of hours. It was whether a state actually licensed 
the occupation in the first place. It was zero or one, very simple binary uh, sort of uh, metric. And so states that licensed over 50% of these low income occupations actually had a low income entrepreneurship rate that was about 11% lower than the national average. The opposite end for those that uh, states that did less than 30% of and just licensing at all of these low income occupations, uh, you had about a 10% higher uh, than national average. So you begin to think, well, what are these specific demographic groups within folks that have low income, uh, rather, sorry, uh, low education levels, uh, low rates of work experience, things of that sort? You begin to realize, well, there's an entire group of people uh, for whom uh, get even further impacted uh, by uh, occupational licensing, and those are people coming out of prison. These are perfect demographic study of folks who have low, in, uh, sorry, low work experience, uh, low levels of education, and yet even when you look at overall occupational licensing levels, there's an additional element, an additional layer of, uh, of licensing burden for people coming out of prison because a lot of states have what they call good moral character provisions. This is a, a prohibition on people coming out of prison who have, uh, even if some cases some misdemeanor crimes, will just simply uh, create uh, a prohibition on the ability of a, a worker with this kind of background to even apply for a license in the first place. It gets rejected out of hand. Now, we don't actually have a lot of uh, economic data about people coming out of prison or people with criminal records because as a practical matter, we just simply don't ask during the census uh, taking process, do you have a criminal record or were you in jail? But we do have some proxy variables. And I'm taking a page out of the, uh, the playbook of a Nobel economist Gary Becker, Workforce opportunities are have opportunity costs, and so if you're coming out of prison and you, it's harder to get a job, well, you might go right back into crime again. And so we can look at what they call the new crime recidivism rate, meaning the reoffense rate uh, for people coming out of prison. And if you look at it over the course of three years, which is pretty important, that's where most of the recidivism occurs. But it's also a pretty critical period. A lot of licenses take three years or more to get in some states, and then you lump on top of them the good moral character provisions, which have been me uh, measured recently by the American Bar Association, and begin to realize maybe this could have a real impact, a robust impact on the recidivism rate over a period of time. And so from 1997 to 2007, which is the period I had the data for, national average about a 3.8% growth of the recidivism rate, actually found that the states with the heaviest burdens, meaning the highest licensing burdens for people without criminal records, and then layered on top of that a good moral character provision in the strictest form, had a 12% growth above and beyond that in the recidivism rate. And in fact, the lightest burden states, those that had low barriers to entry for everyone without criminal records and no good moral character provisions, actually saw a decline in the uh, recidivism rate of two and a half percent. So this goes beyond just burdening people and keeping them out of the workforce. It actually becomes a criminal justice issue and I would argue a public safety issue as well. And so these downstream effects of licensing is something that economists have begun to start looking at. And I think that's a part of the, the broader intellectual framework against uh, these kinds of licensing burdens. So thanks very much. Uh, who's next actually, is it? Adam? Oh, Adam, great. Yeah. Well, thanks and thanks for having me here. Uh, again, my name is Adam Thier, uh, I cover the uh, public policy ramifications of various emerging technologies. And more generally, over the last 25 years, working for five different nonprofit institutions, I have covered the growth of the administrative state and regulatory burdens more generally. And to sort of like give you a high level feel for where we stand circa 2019, uh, I'll give you a sort of we live in the best of times, worst of times kind of scenario. I'll start with the, the pessimistic worldview, like where we stand with the, the growth of regulation and uh, occupational licensing. So at the federal level, where we don't have as much occupational licenses, but we have different licenses and different forms of regulation, um, the regulatory burden has been estimated the compliance and economic effects of federal intervention at 1.9 trillion annually by my former colleague, Wayne Cruz, who's now at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And Wayne says, quote, if it were a country, the US regulatory burden would be the world's eighth largest economy, <laughs> ranking behind India and ahead of Italy. That's how big our regulatory burden is in the United States. Uh, third pessimistic thing is that, uh, according to a Deloitte survey recently done of the U.S. federal code, 68% of federal regulations have never been updated even once, and only 17% have been updated once. So the vast majority of the federal code is put in place and never touched again. Fourth pessimistic thing to report is that there has been no comprehensive industrial deregulations in most of our lifetimes. You'd have to go back to the Carter years and the Civil Aeronautics Board with airlines. After that, there wasn't any major uh, deregulation, nor was there any major agencies really abolished or downsized. They've only just grown since that time. Meanwhile, final pessimistic point, at the state level, we have the occupational licensing burden, which is formidable. Um, depending on which numbers you believe, roughly 20 to 30% of all occupations are licensed in this country now, up from just 5% in the 1950s. Uh, 
Um, these restrictions from occupational licenses uh, cost about 2.8 million fewer jobs nationwide with an annual cost to consumers of $203 billion. These are profound burdens, and this is really why we live in the worst of times. But wait, we live in the best of times, I was meant to say, because I want to leave an, leave an optimistic note here, because reform is happening, at least at the state level, on a number of these fronts. We're starting to see some serious comprehensive regulatory reform initiatives undertaken, and my colleagues at the Mercatus Center have documented this in states like Idaho, which recently sunset its entire regulatory code and decided to go back and put them back on the books one at a time to see what was worth keeping. Or Ohio, Virginia, New Jersey, who've had one in one out rules or one in two out rules. For every regulation you want to put on, you've got to find one or two that you take off the books. Meanwhile, that broad-based regulatory reform uh, efforts are being accompanied by occupational re uh, reform efforts as well. You're starting to see states like Arizona, West Virginia, Nebraska, and others entertain various types of measures ranging from an Occupational Board Reform Act to uh, licensing reciprocity bills to uh, so-called right to earn a living uh, legislation. These are really profoundly beneficial, and I'm, I'm optimistic a lot of states are going to take these on, and we're starting to see serious comprehensive reform. But that's actually not why I'm most optimistic. Uh, having spent all my life fighting back against the administrative state and uh, the permission society, as Tim calls it, I have found that the thing to be most optimistic about is not the prospects for legislative reform, but really the prospects for technological change to really start to change the equation with regards to the permission society. I wrote about this most recently in my last book called Permissionless Innovation, The Continuing Case for Comprehensive Technological Freedom. And I write about it in my next book on evasive entrepreneurialism, which is due out from the Cato Institute early next year. And basically the point I try to make in this, in this book, in these two books, is that if you really want to see how we move the ball forward with regards to the permission society, it comes by people basically confronting it directly and innovating around it, basically doing an end run around the inefficient, old, archaic methods and regulatory systems of the past. I mean, think about just one paradig paradigmatic example of the sharing economy and what Uber and Lyft were able to do. For the better part of the last century, economists, political scientists, and even government agencies all agreed that transportation and hospitality regulation in this country was a hopeless mess, was an anti-consumer fiasco. And we tried and tried and tried to reform this thing. There were reams of uh, studies written and, and regulatory submissions filed and everything else to try to clean up taxi cab commissions and hotel regulations. Nothing changed. And then along came Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, and overnight, the whole equation changed, right? All of a sudden, consumers tasted the water of true choice and competition, and they liked it and we weren't going back. And it's an interesting example of how evasive entrepreneurialism is happening, not just in that sector, but in many other sectors of our economy. In my next book, I document dozens of case studies in the fields of transportation, finance, uh, medicine, agriculture, food production and distribution, and many, many, many others to document how entrepreneurs are sort of taking matters in their own hands and pushing back. Because when they do, they change the political dynamic. They change the, the equation when it comes to having a discussion or a negotiation about the permission society. The example I read off to ask Tim's opinion about, about what's happening in San Francisco is interesting because, of course, we live in a world of innovation arbitrage where a lot of people, once they look at this and this permitting system that, that San Francisco is going to put in place, they're going to leave. They're going to get out of there, right? But San Francisco's going to have a hard time just keeping up with the technologies that are already out there in the wild. Um, this is the so-called pacing problem, the, the fact that technologies evolve very rapidly, sometimes exponentially, but public policy evolves incrementally, and the gap between them is growing every year. When you combine the pacing problem with innovation arbitrage and evasive entrepreneurialism, then it starts to really change the dynamic of how we can think about the future of the permission society and whether we can confront it head on by basically trying to find a way to create this as almost a new business model. In fact, there's business books being written right now. A new one called The Fixer by Bradley Tusk and another one called Regulatory Hacking by Evan Burfield. These guys aren't philosophers or lawyers or political scientists. They're business consultants who basically have gone out there and advised innovators for how to deal with the permission society. And they say you've got to essentially model that regulatory risk in. And yes, it could be significant. And guess what? You could go down. You could go to jail. You could, there could be serious problems here, right? This is why lawyers don't want to touch this kind of stuff. Do you want to advise a client like to do this stuff? It's really easy, isn't it, isn't it, to defend Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb ex post? But how many people defended them ex ante, right? This is what my next book does. I say there's a moral case in favor of evasive entrepreneurialism to take on archaic power structures that ultimately undermine our rights and liberties. 
And so therefore, we have to ask ourselves, this, this should be also part of our agenda, our playbook, for how to deal with the Permission Society going forward. Thank you. So uh, I do a lot of lobbying on economic liberty issues for the Institute for Justice. But as the only lawyer on the panel, I actually feel a special need to, to criticize and call out the court's roles in the, in the growth of the Permission Society. Uh, Tim talked about this earlier, the, w the way that courts have, re or the, that we uh, today screw up privileges versus rights. The courts have done us one better and screwed up the word rights. Um, we now have fundamental rights and we have other rights which uh, are not treated as rights. If you have a fundamental right at stake uh, and you go to the court and you ask for that right to be protected, what the courts do is they say, okay, you have a fundamental right. Excuse me, you've, you've, you've shown that you have a fundamental right. They'll turn to the government and say, government, why do you have this rule? What are you doing with it? Are there better options? Is this narrowly tailored, the, the magic language? And the burden is on the burden of proof is on the government to show that their regulation is justified given the facts and circumstances of the situation. That's what we think of when we think of having rights adjudicated. But those are only for fundamental rights. If you have a not fundamental right, and uh, the right to earn an honest living is not treated as a fundamental right uh, by the American court system, then you are in something called rational basis world, which requires neither a rationale nor a basis. And in fact, it requires you to do precisely the thing that Tim has rightly said is impossible. You have to prove a negative. If you go to court and you say, I have a right to shampoo hair without having to spend $19,000 on 1,500 hours of classes just to shampoo hair, the court will say, that's great. You need to negative every possible justification the state could have for implementing this rule. Go. And that's what you get. To, to give you an example of how this plays out in the real world, uh, there's a case that I, I love called Dana's Railroad Supply Company. It's an otherwise forgettable case, but it really goes to illustrate this problem. Uh, there's a rule. Um, you can add a 3% a surcharge. If you're a retailer and you take credit cards, you can add a 3% surcharge. You get charged for the use of the card. You can add a 3% surcharge. We've probably all done this. Uh, but there was another rule that said, look, you can't say you're adding a 3% surcharge. You can say you're giving a 3% discount for cash, but you can't say 3% surcharge for a card. And this rule is taken, taken to the courts, and, the, and Dana's Railroad Supply says, this is dumb. We want to be able to tell the truth about what we're doing. And the courts say, well, this case turns on whether this is a regulation of conduct, it's an economic regulation, or speech. If this is a regulation of conduct, then you have to justify every potential reason the government could have had to do this rule. But if it's a regulation of speech, well, then government, please tell me why you have this rule. And the, the trial court said, well, this is a regulation of conduct. And although the government can't come up with any good enough rule, I'm going to theorize some on my own that no one has ever heard of before. And these aren't really all that great of reasons. And in fact, everyone recognizes, I'm just making this up. But that's what you do under rational basis. And so I uphold the law. And the case goes up on appeal. And the Court of Appeals says, well, no, 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 no. This is a regulation of speech. And therefore, the court was right. There aren't any good enough reasons for actually having this rule. And so the rule is unconstitutional. What the hell does it matter? It's the same rule. Why does it make sense to say in one case, well, you have to have real important reasons? And in another case, say, well, made up reasons query whether made up reasons are really reasons at all. Made up reasons are perfectly good enough to justify the restriction on what you want to do. If you're trying to earn a living, does a made up reason really satisfy you as to why you're not allowed to earn an honest living doing the thing that you're perfectly capable of doing? That's the problem that we have in the courts today. And that's the role of the courts have played in this. They have taken themselves out of their constitutional job of providing a check on what the political branches do. And today, they act much more as a rubber stamp when it comes to regulations that restrict people's ability to earn an honest living. I should know. I have lost a case in the Eighth Circuit where the court said, well, there's a rule that says you have to have a license to braid hair. And it's 1,500 hours of training. And the state admits 1,400 hours of those are totally irrelevant to what you're doing. But that 100 hours may be relevant, and that's good enough for government work. 
constitutional hair braider get you to, to cosmetology school. It'll spend, take you a year of your life. It'll cost you about $20,000. But you know, once you get out, you'll be able to braid people's hair. That's the world in which we live, uh, and that's the role the courts have played, and that's the thing that it, groups like the Institute for Justice, the Goldwater Institute, and, and increasingly a larger number of, of institutions, state-based institutions across the country, uh, are fighting to undo one step at a time. Okay, so uh, fill out your cards with questions. I've got a few questions for our panelists uh, while you uh, think of yours. Uh, so the first thing we have to address, as everyone always brings up, is safety. And we all understand uh, you know, that a lot of this is, is nonsense. I mean, the, the shampooer, uh, <laughs> shampooing schools were uh, concerned about safety. We know that's silly. But we also know that, uh, I don't know, maybe we want lawyers to have some sort of training uh, how do we make, so how do we work through it? That's my question, A any of you to jump in. How do we make that distinction in a clear way to people who are seriously concerned about, well, whether it endangers safety uh, to reduce some of these rules? Uh, I mean, s from our perspective, the, the, the most th important thing is facts matter. If you can't make a distinction between someone who does brain surgery and someone who's shampooing hair, why are you, why do you have the power to regulate if you can't make that distinction uh, based on obvious observable facts? And I, I should note there that I've I've just committed a fallacy myself. No state actually does or no state actually does license uh, uh, brain surgery. States license doctors, and from a regulatory perspective, uh, a brain surgeon is a plastic surgeon is an anesthesiologist. They're all the same thing. They're all MDs. Believe it or not, most of what we think of as, as medical regulation in this country is actually privately provided. It's insurance companies, it's hospitals, it's board certifications. N none of that, the gov that's not the government. That's, that's a whole bunch of private institutions that have built up to try and provide those sorts of, of quality and safety checks, um, which demonstrates that if it can happen for something as important as medicine, it can certainly happen for something as relatively commonplace as shampooing hair. Well, I would just want to say something on this. Uh, this was the focus of my book on uh, permissionless innovation versus the precautionary principle, which is the antithesis of permissionless innovation. And the precautionary principle basically states that you have no right to innovate or, or offer new goods and services to the public until such time you can prove that they're, fail that they're safe, mm -hmm. that there's no possibility of harm. I mean, the problem with that principle should, should be pretty straightforward, which is that if you spend all of your time living in fear of hypothetical worst case scenarios and then base public policy upon worst case scenarios, then by definition, many best case scenarios can never right. come about if you're focused only on worst case thinking. That being said, safety is an important public policy goal, and there are times when public policy should address it. But there needs to be some standards. There needs to be some rational evaluation of the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. And what I tried to outline in my book is that when we talk about risks or harms, we need to get clear about what we mean by them. And, th and there is a case to be made for precaution when the harm in question is highly probable, tangible, immediate, irreversible, or catastrophic in nature. But the vast majority of human activity and innovative acts are not of that character. They do not belong in a bucket where you have a precautionary approach that says thou shall not with a mother may I permitting system. We do have that approach for something like nuclear weapons, for chemicals, for other types of truly hazardous types of things. We may need it for other new innovations that come along. There's a lot of talk now about genetic editing and about what that could do to the unborn, and there's legitimate ethical debate there. Let's have that conversation, but let's not pretend that should be the standard for everything. Hair braiding, shampooing, flower arranging, interior design? No, these are not harms in a traditional sense. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that so the empirical work on this is actually pretty straightforward, especially when you look at things like dentistry or, or medical professions. And Morris Kleiner, uh, sort of the kind of the godfather of, of this work, uh, basically makes a very consistent point through all this work. And you see it over across a different number of different occupations. That is, the licensing burdens have no statistically significant impact on the actual health and safety outcomes in the states uh, or at the state level. Uh, and what's what's kind of amazing about this is if people are worried about the, the health and safety outcomes. There's other ways of doing it that are not licensing. In fact, if anything, licensing is the worst way of getting at these health and safety outcomes. I mean, we don't license short order cooks. Instead, what we do is we have spot cleanliness checks of kitchens and such. And so it becomes a health, a Department of Health issue and not a licensing board issue. And so so the, the, the lever and, and the tool used mm -hmm. is often far disproportionate.
disproportionately burdensome relative to what kind of impact you could have if you did other things. Yeah, yeah I was just going to mention, uh, you might have the laudable goals of the safety and the quality, but as you just mentioned, the, you could take a certification approach, like the restaurant industry, at least here in California, is a good example. Mm -hmm. Chefs, short order or fancy chefs, um, you know, the people that prepared our meal today, they don't have an occupational license, at least to my knowledge in this state, but restaurants are graded, mm -hmm. consumers have information, and consumers can make choices, right? So it could be the same with any profession that you think of. I mean, another example is uh, my wife is a CPA, so she's certified to do something, but people have other choices. There are things called enrolled agents. There are, you can do it yourself, so forth. Um, so having this ex ante sort of occupational license required is a very um, heavy-handed way if your goal is um, occupational safety. The other two, two things I would just mention briefly is from the standpoint of pure economic theory, you could argue that an occupational license in a setting where you are going to end up with high quality and low quality providers might play the role of incentivizing me to invest in education, to improve the quality of the product that I will offer because I won't have to compete against these low quality providers. Okay, so there's a shred of theory there. But that just means it becomes an empirical matter. And like um, was mentioned, um, the empirics are pretty clear here. Like even when you take something as skilled as dentistry, and you say, well, aren't they licensed everywhere? But there are variations between the states and in certain states um, at different times. And so there is variation, and you can look at the actual quality. And um, Kleiner and others study dentistry because it's so wonderfully measurable. Like what's the, mm -hmm. you know, how many cavities do people have um, at school children and get measured and so forth? And there's been no impact of how strict the occupational licensing is on prevention of um, cavities and so forth. Let me just mention one other piece of evidence because I think it's interesting and it gets at the other issue of some of the uh, demographic groups adversely affected by this. Teachers in some states face higher forms of occupational licensing requirements, although we don't always call it that because um, through educational requirements or various certifications that they have to have or don't have to have. And there was a very important study in American Economic Review, which is the flagship journal in my field, um, that looked at teacher testing requirements, a form of occupational licensing. And there was no evidence that they raised the quality of either new teachers or experienced teachers, but there was an impact. What was the impact? Um, if you want fewer Hispanic teachers or Latino teachers in your state, have these sorts of tests. Uh, one practical thing, too, is that all of these all of, all of everything that has been said is absolutely true, and I promise you that most state legislators have never heard it uh, and have no idea that it's out there. Um, and this is especially true for part-time legislatures like we have throughout most of the West. Uh, and if you ever actually go to a legislative hearing where they're talking about occupational licensing and you are not a member of the affected industry, uh, you're probably going to be the only person in the room. Um, and so these things are eye-opening as to the sorts of things that get said. Because industry, to its credit, has learned you can't just say, well, we want this license because it'll protect us from competition. Even the, the most, de well, not even the most, all but the most dense legislators get that that's a problem. So they come in and they say, oh my god, the streets will run red with blood if you allow chiropractors to do animal chiropractic without having a veterinary license. And so the hearing devolves into veterinarians versus chiropractors over who gets that piece of the market, and no one from the public shows up because we all have better things to do with our lives than listen to this kind of horseshit. Um, it's just insane what, what happens there. The, I can't, I blame the legislators, but if they don't know these things, we can't expect better of them, and it's incumbent on us to spend time going down there and telling them these things. Yeah, on our shampooing bill, uh, the, we had gotten it through one, one uh, house, and on the other house, uh, they brought out hundreds of students from the barbering and cosmetology, yeah. and then that was the end of the story. So, uh, and they were worried about all sorts of diseases of the scalp, so go figure. Okay, here's some, I've got some audience questions. Uh, and this is, this is a good one, because uh, this first one, um, I've, this is one of the things we're always told that there should be left and right should agree on this. 
be, and, and it makes sense. I mean, the Obama administration had passed some, uh, I forget what it was, but it was some sort of effort to reform these rules, and a lot of conservative uh, legislators and, uh, and, and Governor Ducey in Arizona. So it sounds like, in theory, that everybody ought to be singing kumbaya, and yet these bills, minor ones, will get through bipartisan, but bigger ones uh, don't get through at all. So here's the question. Uh, to what extent have left-leaning groups joined the effort to reduce um, barriers to entry into uh, low-skilled professions? So have you I seen serious entry by, by liberal groups? Uh, well, I, I certainly have, I, specifically in reference to the criminal justice issue, when I was talking about the good moral character provisions, yeah. so ACLU, other left of center groups uh, will often kind of gravitate toward that because th there's the specific right. subpopulation they're trying to, you know. Right, the criminal sort of, justice angle. Yeah, the criminal justice angle. Yeah. So, so, so there's some interesting entry points there as well. Uh, I do think there's, there's, there is quite a bit of, of bipartisan consensus on, as you say, the kind of the, the impacts of it because of the Obama administration. Actually, there was a report that came out of the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and uh, it, to, to quote an old Vulcan proverb, it's sort of the Nixon goes to China kind of moment. And with that, I got the first Star Trek reference in. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, but uh, the reason it's important is because it, it cited work from all across the spectrum. And, and again, it was, it was, a, it was a, uh, Obama uh, initiative. And so as a result, it was something that was, it was safe for people on the left to come out and, and kind of make these broader claims because the guy at the top said it, right? So, so there's, there's a, I think, still a, a political impetus that, that's there and can be harnessed in certain specific discrete ways. Like the criminal justice one seems to be the most obvious. But I do think over time it's going to slowly start kind of spreading into other, other aspects. It's certainly less partisan, but the, the big issue, the big division is the insiders versus the outsiders. Right. And yeah. it's really the insiders versus the people who aren't in the room because they've got better things to do with their time than go down to the legislature and lobby for their ability to have unlicensed uh, shampooing. That's the big, that's the big, that's the big split, and that's the, we've, we've won the policy arguments, it's the political battle now that has to be won, and that is harder because you can't just do that with white papers, you actually have to, to be there and hold people's feet to the fire, which takes more time. Yeah, and here's a question that, you know, gets at that and gets at what I'm wanted to ask too about, you know, these gatekeepers seem almost uh, insurmountable, their burdens, and, um, and here someone asks, how do, how do individuals fight, uh, you know, this unrealistic and practical government regulations? So, I mean, we, uh, a couple, couple of minor uh, occupational licensing reforms passed uh, and became law in the California legislature. Uh, well, one of them, I guess, Senator Bates' bill that would have, uh, would allow portability from, but only for limited number of professions of, of therapists. And so I guess it's whoever has the best lobbyists, right, as it comes down to, um, you know, the one we, that we sponsored uh, basically eliminated fees if you were in a disaster area. Who's going to vote no on that? I mean, it, you know, it doesn't hurt. But to get something, you know, wide-ranging reform, how do we shift that paradigm? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is something we've spent a lot of time at the Mercatus Center thinking about the economists and political scientists there because the, you really have to think in a game theoretical way about what it takes to break yourself out of this logjam. And, you know, when Tim was doing his talk, he talked about the the public choice problems surrounding the permission society, starting with the fact that people live to obtain the government's favor. Well, once they've done so and they've invested in legislation and invested in regulation, they're not going to give it up easily. You're going to have to fight them for it, and then you have all of the bureaucrats who have a vested interest in keeping their power alive and their funding alive. You have to find a way to break out of that. I am, I am most optimistic about devices that are based on the old BRAC commission idea of the, the base realignment and closure commission, where basically we knew that there was a problem with lawmakers not being willing to allow their, their military bases and camps to be sunset after the Cold War ended. We had to basically say, take that out of your hands, put it in the form of a commission, let them decide what should remain and what should go, and then you vote up or down on the whole package. And this has become the basis of a lot of the reforms for the occupational board reform kind of a, uh, approach. You get all these basic licensing systems, you basically like, like, let's see what we can do. Let's put all these folks in a room and study this, take it out of the legislative and regulatory branch, have an independent study and then say, okay, here's our package of proposals, vote up or not on this, and at least get some of this stuff off the books. They'll still fight it, the people with vested interests. But when the lawmakers see like, look, you know, 75% of this I'm with, it's good, it makes sense, there's a better chance that we get that reform through than if we just have one where that all those interests will come out and say, no, we absolutely have to preserve the plumbing license. This has to stay. All the plumbers will come out. I recently wrote a, uh, an essay about that, and oh my gosh, the plumbers were all over me. And it, it's another example of why it's great to study occupational licensing, because five states have no plumbing licensing whatsoever. And all I would do is respond to them and say, like, 
tell me about all the exploding toilets in Missouri where they have none of these things? Not happening. You know, who's dying, you know, drowning in their toilet? Not, uh, not, not that I've seen, you know. I never hire licensed plumbers. But. Yeah, right. And, and so the question is, you know, why is it those things remain? Because we try to take it directly on. We need a more sophisticated approach to it. Well, when, when the shampooing bill was killed, what the, what the uh, head of the committee, uh, the chairman said, well, we're going to send it to the Sunset Committee, which is a, mm -hmm. the assembly has that committee, I think it's annually, and they do a sunset, they review all the agencies that might be sunsetted. The only problem is they've never sunsetted anything <laughs> in its entire existence. Right. That's so just, nationwide. Yeah, so it just becomes a way of, uh, of saying, oh, well, we'll deal with it in this committee, which, of course, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, isn't going to do anything. <laughs> Um, yeah, a anybody else want to address that point? Well, it's, just, it's interesting you mentioned the plumbers because in the quality argument, the argument that, that gets made time and time again is this mythical boiler room explosion, right? Because the plumber who wasn't properly certified did something wrong in the, you know, back in the days of steam powered stuff or whatever, like the, mm -hmm. the boiler room explosion, yeah. that's what we have to prevent yeah. happening so we license mm -hmm. florists. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. Also, right. also, when was the last time you saw a boiler? <laughs> yeah. Right. Also, I just want to tie it back to a, to a point that Tim made in his remarks, the idea that kind of the, the, the basis of evidence in these types of sunset uh, commission type things, uh, it usually there'll just be something to the effect of, oh, well, as long as they can pass a financial audit, we'll just rubber stamp this and give it a 10-year you know, new lease on life. And there's never ever a discussion as to whether there's actually other ways of accomplishing the same public policy goals, whether uh, this is yeah. past a simple cost-benefit analysis. It's not a financial audit question, it's sort of an economic evidence question. Uh, in that respect. And so having rules that actually require those sorts of things are probably a pretty, uh, getting closer to the BRAC model than it does the current situation. We, we got ourselves into this situation not by doing just one thing wrong. We did a whole lot of really stupid things over a really long time. And so it's there's no one magic bullet, I don't think. There's a whole host of things that we've got to do. These sort of internal government restructuring, uh, sunrise, sunset ideas are good. Uh, uh, really being able to curtail the power of administrative boards where most of this regulation actually happens in sort of a sub sublegal way. Like what the boards do is oftentimes they'll call you in and they say, oh, you want to do X. Let's talk about whether what you can do and let's let's negotiate what you can do and what you can't do under our regulatory system. And, and people settle these sorts of consent agreements all the time because it's just easier than fighting. That's another area that we have to fix. One area that, that we need to fix uh, that both IJ and Goldwater have worked on is making it easier for people to stand up for their own rights in court uh, and, and giving people the ability to meaningfully challenge just truly ridiculous statutes and regulations that inhibit their ability to earn an honest living by putting the, the onus, as you would with any right, back on the government to actually justify the restriction they've got in the first place. This isn't to say that all restrictions will go away. Some may be able to be justified. In fact, probably more than many in this room would like. But it's a step in the right direction that along with all the rest of these steps, we need to be taking. Because again, they, we didn't unmake Rome in a day. But I like the point, I think, Stephen, you probably mentioned it earlier that there really isn't a demonstrable uh, uh, correlation between the quality of someone who's licensed and the quality is. And so I always say, uh, whenever we hire people, my wife, she'll go in the Yellow Pages or Yelp or whatever, and she'll get licensed contractors. And I'm like, oh, no, God, no. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I remember my neighbor, my neighbor and I, we each had our house painted at the same time. I got my guys out of the Home Depot par parking lot, and they got a, but, but the point I want to make, mine was done much better, much cheaper, and uh, was done on time. Uh, so anyway, uh, but, but the contractors I talk to who do that, they, they, who, they say, well, you know, we have so many burdens, and we have, we have and, and they make a po good point uh, that when you hire the, the unlicensed ones, uh, you end up, um, you know, you, we can't compete with that. So, so I, what I see happening is, is, you know, we get this bigger divergence between the underground folks uh, and the Department of Economic Crimes trying to arrest them and these folks who keep getting burdened more and more and more. So uh, I don't know if there's a way of addressing that point at all and how, how that can be dealt with, how that argument can be dealt with, because I, I think there's some validity to it. Well, just, I mean, so you could think, again, of a certification model. Like, don't yeah. make it, don't make the low-cost option be illegal. Just right. make it, provide information about why it might possibly be lower quality. In the example that you mentioned, for example, they might not have the right types of insurance.
insurance. Mm -hmm. But you have the choice to do that. As, I mean, so the role of the government here could be perhaps, or the role of an industry board could be to certify some, not certify others, but allow all. Also provide the information to the consumer so they know what they are and aren't um, getting as well. And then, you know, to quote someone we've probably heard before, give them the freedom to choose. Yeah. Okay. Here are a couple questions. Um, here's one. Don't, don't most third world countries have a large bootleg economy because they uh, de facto uh, don't, you know, don't allow people to, to work within, make a living within the law? So anyone want to address that point? I mean, there's evidence that we have a large black market uh, economy in this country, too, um, especially in certain areas. Uh, you know, when I started this job uh, back in 2010, at the time, more than half of all states required a cosmetology license to braid hair, just to braid hair. Um, I, think the, I think the count at the time was, was 28 uh, required a license to braid hair. You could go into any one of those 28 states and find uh, African American or African immigrant women who were earning a living braiding hair and they had no license. They were doing it from home or they had set up a storefront and no one had ever bothered them and why would they need a license? Because why would you need a license to braid hair in the first place? And so you had these, these, these black market economies that were, were flourishing and, and I gotta be honest, it was actually hard to talk some of these women into standing up for their own rights to sue the government because why would they? That, you know, they don't wanna be the nail that sticks up. That's the one that gets hammered back down um, the government was leaving them alone. What they were doing was clearly illegal, and everyone recognized it, but no one was going to bother them. And, and until they got bothered, they weren't going to do anything about it. So we have that here, too. Contractors, it happens with contractors all the time. As someone who also hires unlicensed contractors whenever he can, uh, I can tell you there's a lot of contractors in Arizona who don't have, who aren't legally contractors. They're operating under handyman exemptions, or they're doing all sorts of other things, uh, or they're just outright breaking the law, and that's you know, fine with me too, but, but we have it here. We're just not seeing it. Yeah, you know, m one small point to add to this, what, what, what Paul's talking about is really the, a variation of this theme of evasive entrepreneurs who basically go out and just do things that you know, can move the ball forward and be innovative. What's interesting is that in my book, I talk about how much of this is happening non-commercially now, that it's not just people doing it for money, but they're sometimes just doing it out of the goodness of their heart, or they're doing it through voluntary contributions or something. The world of drones is very heavily regulated, and drone photography is becoming a big thing at weddings. And if you hire someone to come to your wedding and take a photo, there's a license you're supposed to get, a permitting process through the FAA, um, if you charge even one penny. But if you're the drunk uncle that just goes to your car and says, I got a drone, I'll take a picture of you, yeah. you're fine and dandy, nothing happens. But you know what? They're going to take that picture. This happens with 3D printers, people making their own stuff using 3D printers, uh, pr prosthetics, which are regulated devices you need a license for, and other types of things. People making these with 3D printers voluntarily, open source blueprint. Um, it, in the world of ride sharing, we all talk about Uber and Lyft, did you know that through Waze, there's actually a way to actually like pick up people just as like a sort of like informal hitchhiking mode? Yeah, they have it in San Francisco. There's yeah. a very- yeah. Casual commute. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So, so now we're seeing in the world of what is sometimes called user innovation or open bottom-up innovation of a non-commercial variety, a challenge to the administrative state and to occupational licensing and all regulatory systems. And that's really interesting because it ties a lot of people, especially people on the left, in knots. Because then they're forced to make an argument that essentially money sullies everything and just by charging a penny you make it unsafe and risky. Which could not be further from the truth. And that goes to a point that Tim makes here. In a, he says if, if you don't need a license to do it for free, you should need a license to do it for money. Yeah. I, would any, I, I think that's exactly Yeah, that's absolutely, that, yeah. Is, that is correct. Can yeah. I go back to a point that Adam was making, which is, you know, one of the things that we are seeing is that as more and more people uh, basically operate outside the rules and then get caught, it's a lot easier for lawmakers to understand and, and even to defend something that already exists. We're not very creative people all the time. We don't always understand, like, when I was a kid, my mom always said, don't get in a car with strangers. And now what do you do with Uber and Lyft? You get in a car with strangers. And it's the, that's the, the smart idea. We, we wouldn't understand these things if they didn't already exist. And one easy way to defend someone's right to do something is to demonstrate they've been doing it for a long time without any problems. And then to get their customers to realize uh, that you know they really liked the thing that was being provided. And so if it really is illegal, they're going to be quite unhappy. There's been a number of states where 
taking, I, I don't mean to pick on cosmetology, but there's a lot of great examples here, where a lot of states make it illegal to provide cosmetological services outside of a salon, which means that something as simple as and common as a hair or makeup artist going to like a bridal suite and doing the bridal party's hair and makeup on the big day is illegal. And when some people started getting into trouble for that, you had a lot of pissed off brides come to the legislature and say, how dare you? And there is nothing more scary than a pissed off bride, except for a pissed off mother of the bride. <laughs> Those people got some things moved and changed because they had the experience of, oh, I liked this thing and now the government's going to take it away. They'd always taken it away. It's just you didn't realize that it was illegal before you saw it. But yeah, one of the things that I used to think, though, that was that innovation with the cat and mouse game, that innovation would <laughs> always win out. And, uh, but now I see with you know, AB5, for, which is a bill that basically bans contractors, uh, Uber, Lyft, um, uh, freelance writers have uh, limit, limited numbers, all sorts of uh, lobbying groups were able to get exemptions for their industry, which is always a sign of a good bill when you have to exempt everybody out of it. But, I can't see how they're going to get anybody's going to get around this. So I keep I'm starting to think that the the forces of malice are probably going to win. I mean, I, so so what, I'm, do I have am I right to be that negative? Do, do you have anything encouraging to say or anything? Yeah, we need to kick California out of the union, and then we probably <laughs> solve the problem. <laughs> but no, it, it, it seriously is is a, is a real problem, and it happens at many levels. But at least we have some competitive federalism options and some escape options with regards to state occupational licensing regulations. Whereas we don't, when you have federal licensing regimes that can quash a form of innovation. You, you want an example of like permissionless innovation gone wrong? Look at what 23andMe tried to do with home genetic testing. And for a while, they were able to do it, had about 140, 150 different markers, genetic markers they were testing for. The FDA was just pestering them. You got to talk to us. You got, we want to regulate this. And then they got a cease and desist notice. And they had to be pulled off the market for 18 months. And what happened to them was bad enough, but what happened to the market was tragic. Because who can name a competitor to 23andMe right now for home genetic testing? And the reason you can't is because the FDA put the fear of God in the genetic testing market, and they chilled it. And there was no competitive option. There was no jurisdictional shopping. There was no innovation arbitrage. So at least when California screws things up, as I know they already have with AB5 and with things like the San Francisco you know, board, mm -hmm. then at least there's some other state to go to. You look what Uber did when they wanted to do driverless car testing, right? Mm -hmm. Governor Ducey said, come on down here. You can do it down here or better terms. They put all of their fleet of driverless vehicles on a truck, and they shipped it down to Arizona. Right? So there at least is a skate valve mechanism there with regards to innovation in some context. Not always. It helps when you have uh, uh, more freedom loving states out there with uh, In other options. words, move to Reno. Right? Well, yeah. maybe. Nevada has some pretty crazy regulations yeah. itself. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe Arizona is your better option. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Well, I, here's a question. Um, when a county demands all new housing must have an HOA with CCNRs, is this really a free voluntary process? Any, anyone want to take that one? <laughs> Isn't that for the next panel? I, <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm <laughs> seeing if anyone had. OK. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. A pro that is a problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, a I'm ans asking questions. To is people the government say. wanting to do it? Yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> yes. There you go. Okay. We got that one covered. And then we'll, uh, let's see. Um, anyone have one last question? We got room for one. I'll throw it out. Yes, sir. Yeah, Chris. So I don't know that there's been a lot, uh, the one non-academic on the panel, I'll answer that question. Um, I don't know that there's been a lot of studies of where complaints come from. Many states actually hide complaint, complainant information uh, when you're doing these things. So uh, we've done public records requests uh, for specific uh, industries, braiding being the prime example, and actually tried to study where did these complaints come from. Uh, what we found for those states that would actually give us the information, at least when it came to braiding, was that uh, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers here. We looked at nine jurisdictions over a seven-year period, found 130 complaints, 125 of which originated from the board. Um, and they all had to do with, you didn't have the right paperwork. Uh, there were very few, if any, complaints about uh, something that could actually be deemed a, a public health or safety threat, and none of those had ever been verified by a board. Uh, I don't know if that's commonplace 
or not. But that's that's the one bit of information I know, and we played hell trying to get that information. You know, one thing I want to add is that it's really important when we're trying to push back against the permission society and the occupational license in particular to have a really powerful, compelling counter narrative. And one of the things I found most effective in my dealings with lawmakers and the general public and, and others is to talk about concrete examples of the many unlicensed types of sectors of the economy where things go on quite nicely every single day. I always use the example of consumer electronics and power tools. Two areas and two technologies involve a lot of risks, right? But for the most part, these sectors work very, very effectively and safety is assured through a combination of industry standards, private certification bodies, reputational effects, uh, good insurance markets, consumer education, and then we have the backstop of torts and contracts and property claims and other things that can, can serve as a remedy when things go wrong. This works extraordinarily well each and every day in our economy, right? We benefit from this, and we don't have this cronyist hell that we have in all these other sectors. And so I always say, like, if I can go and buy a power saw and not need an occupational license to do it, even though I could chop off my arm and almost have many times, <laughs> Why in the hell can't I braid somebody's hair or cut it? You can get a license to ride a motorcycle too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So.